Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through Agon, which is a mythic, ancient Greek-inspired role-playing game, although it's really close to the storytelling side of role-playing. It's less on the gritty action resolution mechanical side of things. It's a really cool system. It's by Evil Hat Productions. They do Blades in the Dark, and so you can expect it to be different in the way that it presents itself in the mechanical system and its overall goal and tone. It's just not, this is definitely not one of those RPGs you've seen a dozen times already. It's not a D20 system where you're trying to roll above a DC or anything like that. Um, I, I mean, there is a DC mechanic, there is a difficulty mechanic you're trying to beat, but it's a really interesting way that it's implemented. And again, the focus here is on storytelling. Now, this is really heavily inspired by the Iliad, the Odyssey, um, the, you know, ancient Greek poetry and mythology. If that's up your alley, then I think you, you really should check this book out, especially right now. It's on sale at Evil Hat Productions. I think it's $25 for both the physical copy and the PDF bundled. Um, you can get the PDF on its own at DriveThruRPG. I'll put links below. But this is a fantastic book. That's my first thing right there. I would say it's excellent. A+. Plus. You should go get it. But I'll go through and talk about some of the details here, as I usually do. There are two additional documents as well. One is a bunch of extra islands, because the... Well, I'll go through that. But the game gives you... The base game gives you a bunch of islands, basically like pre, pre-made settings for, for adventure. And then there's a book with a bunch of extra ones. And then there's the player kit, which has the character sheet and some of the extra materials that you need to play the game. Because it's actually, it looks fairly complicated. And I will say that right away, that when you, when you briefly scan through this document, because it's different, and it is very different than other RPGs, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little off-putting simply because it looks different. But it's not off-putting in the design. I mean, the, 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 you, you can see there's a lot of stuff going on. But it's all presented in a very pretty way, in a way that is very uh, cohesive with the with the overall tone. Um, so this is John Harper and Sean Nittner, as I said, or maybe as I said already. If I didn't, um, those are the two main writers, uh, the designers and the writing team. And there's a bunch of extra playtesters and things that you get on the front page. And as I said, this is Evil Hat Productions. They do, um, yeah, Blades in the Dark and, and other games like that. Uh, a thank you page and an acknowledgments page, the table of contents. And again, even in like the, the, the table of contents, you can see that the chapter headings are, are in line with the overall tone of the game, which is this ancient sort of Greek theme. You get the thesis, origin, trials, respite, legend, grace, guidance, islands, compendium, lexicon, and cultural primer. But the trials, the respite, or respite or respite, uh, legend, grace, these, these terms for the different chapters and the concepts that are going to be within those chapters really bring you into the overall uh, tone of the game. Here's the art that you're going to find throughout. It's excellent art. It fits really, really well. It's, it's, it's unique. It certainly has its own look going on. But that's great. It fits with the uniqueness of this game. Each chapter heading has the subheadings within that chapter. So you have the thesis, which is you know, the, the beginning, of your, <laughs> the beginning of, your, of your story, the beginning of your point, the, the main point you're trying to make. So in this heading, you have the heroes of legend, the game, the players, cycles of play, the dice, and touchstones. Um, heroes of legend. The goal of this game is to recreate epic tales about heroes like Odysseus on his uh, journey home or Achilles at the, the walls of Troy. It really is going for a mythic epic tone. This is not going to be slapstick, although, you know, it, it acknowledges that the tone of the game is up to you at the table, but the, but the system as a whole is designed to have a much more serious, much more mythic, epic tone. Uh, you know, they also say, you know, you can do sort of more like Xena, Warrior Princess, or Clash of the Titans, or something like that. They even say that you could do like the Fast and the Furious if you want, but, you know, that's, that's uh, just up to you. <laughs> The two main aspects of this game that you have that each character has is Divine Favor and Pathos. Right? Divine Favor is sort of their connection to the gods, and Pathos is their humanity, their, you know, the deep inner uh, connection that we have to them, and it comes out of hardship, and it's their power, you know, their passion, and all this stuff. I, I really like these ideas. Now, if either of these or both of these go down, then your hero, uh, basically their hero enters agony. Um, and uh, they get really close to actually just dying or leaving the, the story. So, really cool there. Uh, the connection to the gods is really, really interesting, and uh, I, I really like the way it's implemented here. The basic mechanics of the game. Now, one of the things that's so interesting about this is this idea of one role resolution. So, the, the DM will present a trial, something, or the DM, the strife player. That's another thing I'll talk about here, is that they're, it's much more collaborative than DM players, but... 
the, the strife player, the, the game runner, the person who's kind of in charge of the threats, they present a trial, a conflict between the heroes and their opponents. Doesn't necessarily have to be other people. It could be a storm at sea or it could be a, you know, a, a, a god or something, who knows what it is, but it's some trial that they have to overcome. And then everybody says how they're gonna to try to solve it. And they like generally, so they say, I'm going to use this ability or that ability. And then they roll, everyone rolls. And then you kind of figure out who succeeded, who succeeded best, who failed. And then you narrate what happened together. So that's what I said, that's what I meant when I said earlier, this is more of a narrative storytelling tool rather than like, okay, you know, like in D&D &D 5e, for example, or in really any D&D &D game, you're trying to sneak into a castle, say, right? And so you roll a stealth check to get up to the wall. Okay, you need to beat a 15. Well, I, I did. I rolled an 18. Okay, great. You're up at the wall. Now what? Well, I'm going to try to climb over the wall. Okay, make an athletics check. All right, I need a 14 to get over this. Okay, I did. I got a 17. Okay, great. You're over the wall. Now I'm inside the wall, and there's a guard standing right there. Okay, I, uh, I try to intimidate him into silence. All right, roll an intimidation check, right? But you, you, you make resolutions for each bit as you're going through the overall trial, the overall aspect of this, of this uh, you know, the overall test here. You, you roll for each section, and so you can succeed or fail at little parts. And those those combination of little successes and failures, and the way that you role play them, the way that you act in them, gives you the overall resolution for that whole adventure or scene or something like that. That's not how this works. This game assumes that you are going to roll once for the trial, and that contest is going to be resolved, and then then you're going to narrate that together leading to a new scene. So there's basically one roll per scene. There is something that you're trying to overcome in that scene, and there is one roll that resolves it. If you succeed, you move on. If you fail, you move on. You know, either either going forward or, or, or going to the side or back or whatever it might be, but you, uh, you don't get to try again. You don't get to like, well, I'm gonna try this other ability now instead, or oh, so I failed the intimidation check. Maybe I can persuade him now. Nothing like that. You try your, 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 your solution, you roll, and if nobody succeeds, that's that's another thing. Everybody can try to succeed. Um, if nobody succeeds, then the, the bad outcome happens. But you, you roll once to resolve it. It's really interesting. I like that a lot. It would be fun to try. Now, as I said, this is much more collaborative, and you can already hopefully see that. It's much more collaborative than like a D&D &D 5e game where the, the goal is to tell a story overall. At least it seems to me that's the, the goal here. And so the players are all called players, even the GM. It's called the Strife player. So you have the Strife player and the hero players. And the Strife player is supposed to be kind of like trading off. It suggests, you know, you might be the Strife player for one island and then a hero player for the next island. The island is sort of the, the, the discrete chunk of play that a session would be based around, like an, an adventure site. And there's some stuff happening there and you have to overcome it to get off the island, to solve it, and then to increase your legend and then to move on. Um, and so you might trade off island to island, which really is collaborative. Then you're not even going to be the GM or the DM for a whole campaign. You might not. You could. It says, you know, you might decide to be a strife player for several islands in a row, but you don't have to. And the strife player is like a guide and referee. Those are the two ways that it's put forward. Guide and referee. So if there's a question, it's the strife player's decision to make uh, an answer to it. And they present the, you know, the, the trials, the tribulations. They control the NPCs and that sort of thing. But really... Really, it's going to be a collaboration uh, between you and the players to develop a good story. The cycle of play, there are certain discrete ways. Of, there's the origin, which is the beginning of an adventure. You make your characters, you give them epithets, names, and, and traits. They establish bonds, and then you pick a leader. They're basically a, a tiebreaker for the people's decisions, and then they have a couple mechanical effects. But it's mostly just you're the leader for, you know, uh, in, in case you, you can't agree or something like that. The leader gets to decide. Then you have trials, and they say each one is like the uh, the sort of scene that you're trying to get through. After you do those trials, there's a mechanical benefit for succeeding at them, and eventually you get to the final battle. And depending on how well you've succeeded or failed at the trials up to that point, the final battle will be easier or harder. And, and, and the outcomes of it will be determined by your successes, so whether or not you totally defeat the enemy or you defeat the enemy in a minor way, whatever it might be, that will be determined by that final battle and by your choices leading up to it. And then finally, after you do that, you go through a period of respite or respite, a respite is how I say it. You leave the island, you record your great deeds, you get some virtue points, which is basically how, how amazing were you in these different ways. And, and the players, the other players decide that. 
which is really cool. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then you sacrifice to the gods. You choose a leader for the new group. You recover any pathos that you've lost. Um, and then you start a new adventure. And at the very end of that cycle, either you, you meet your fate, which is you die, or you lose all your pathos and divine favor and you, you leave the story, or you come home, which is the final, the, the homecoming, which is the final adventure. Then you record your, your name, you go through the whole thing, you, you forge your legend, and you're done. So you can very much see this is about creating these epic heroes who have done these cool things, telling their story over a period of time, and then then you end. And you can play a new one or whatever you might want, but that, that's their story. So it's very much, right, very much like the Odyssey, I think, is a good example there. And actually, that's sort of the overall idea here, is that you're heroes who have just come from a great war and you're trying to get home. That's the, the assumed scenario for the game, which, which is the Odyssey, right? He's <laughs> the Trojan War for 10 years, Odysseus has, he's trying to get home to Ithaca, spends 10 years trying to get back and has these various adventures and trials and, and becomes a, a better man in this way and loses his sense of uh, you know, uh, selfishness in that way and just it becomes a great hero over that time. Here are the dice that you need to play the game. It's D4s, 6s, 8s, 10s, and 12s, no D20. And then touchstones, you know, to get a feel for the game. And there's Xena, Warrior Princess, the Iliad and the Odyssey, Song of Achilles and Circe, Clash of the Titans, Jason and the Argonauts, Wonder Woman, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, the Sinbad books, or movies, I should say. The Fast and the Furious, now I haven't seen The Fast and the Furious, so uh, I don't know why this is in amongst those. I'm sure there's a reason. I'm sure it's probably like it has to do with, you know, epic heroes telling these stories or something like that, like larger-than-life figures. I don't know exactly why, but I assume there's a good connection there. And then Apotheon, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and Hades. So those are the influences and the things that you would have to be familiar with and to enjoy in order to really get into this game. I love all of those. Jason and the Argonauts, the movie by Don Chafee, was like my movie growing up. I loved that movie. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Okay, the origin, creating a hero. To create a hero, you create an epithet. It's the first thing you do, and you know, perfect in if you've read the Iliad or the Odyssey, you'll know you're talking about you know, lithe limbed or silver tongued or iron minded or far sighted. Uh, you know, these 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 great epithets that stick with your character that call them to mind. You pick one, and you get a die that begins at a d6 for that epithet. And basically, whenever your epithet would apply to a particular task you're trying to do, you can add that d6 in to the pool. So it's it's a dice pool game. So you're rolling a bunch of dice and you're picking a couple of them to use. You're trying to get above a certain number. And so the more dice you get to roll, the better chances are you'll roll high, and that's good. So you want more dice. And so the ability to add your epithet die in is good. So you pick one that will be useful at times. You're not always going to get to use it, but you, you're going to want to use as much as you can. Then you get your name. right? The, 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 the name of your hero. This is something that you're always going to get to roll, basically. This is how glorious you are, how famous you are. You announce yourself right when you're about to try one of these challenges as a player, as a hero. And that's something right out of the Iliad, right? I mean, people don't fight in the Iliad before they first figure out who the other is. Or very often, you know, I, Achilles, will kill you, Hector. You know, like, you know, because you killed my friend Patroclus. Like, there's a, there's a sort of a who's who is important in the facing down a challenge. Um, in the Odyssey, when he's about to flee from the Cyclops, he can't help but tell him his real name because he's trying to grow his glory, right? Um, instead of saying that he's Nemo, no one, right? He says, I'm Odysseus. And of course, that causes tons of trouble for him later. It's great. And you have your lineage. This is your significant ancestor or, or parent, your scion, your origin. You can choose to have a god. Um, and that does have some effects. So you can have your, you can be a demigod, right? The, 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 uh, you're, you're the descendant of, of Aphrodite or of Zeus. Um, you can choose. And then there are four domains, and uh, you choose a favored domain that fits with your lineage. And those domains are arts and oration, blood and valor, craft and reason, and resolve and spirit. Those are the different ways that you solve things. So you choose which of those you're going to use to approach a problem. I'm going to use arts and oration, blood and valor, craft and reason, or resolve and spirit. And you have to sort of explain how it works. So again, it's not necessarily like, okay, the DM doesn't say, or the, the strife player doesn't say, okay, make an arts and oration check. Rather, here is the challenge. You know, a great serpent has surrounded the island and has bewitched the priests of the island through its hypnotic gaze, and now they are, you know, sacrificing the people to it instead of to the gods. How are you going to solve this? Here is your first challenge, you know, sailing past the coils of the snake onto the island. You might say, well, I'm going to use, I'm going to use my craft and reason. I'm going to try to, you know, uh, look for the moment when, uh, 
when the snake's coils open a bit and I'm going to be so observant, you know, I'll go for that or something like that, or I'm going to hack at the snake's coil so that it writhes and we can sail through when it's a, you know, you have to describe what you're doing to solve the problem. But you can describe whatever you want. You can try whatever you want in that regard. Um, you begin with marks of divine favor. Basically, you can call upon the gods to help you in certain circumstances. Here are the gods and their uh, different domains and cool little, um, you know, constellations that are associated with them. I think that's really cool. Aphrodite, uh, Apollo, Artemis, Athena, Ares, Demeter. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is that the gods are from Greek mythology, but the islands that are presented are just totally made up as far as I can tell. So, you know, if you wanted to, you could you could draw on your knowledge of Greek and of the Greek islands and the Greek mythology to use real islands from the Aegean and the Mediterranean. But this game sort of just assumes that you're going to be making up your own. So it has a whole bunch of made-up islands. Uh, here is the style of your character, what they look like. Uh, the bonds that your character has, and you, you form them with each other, and you use them as the game goes on. You can use your bonds to protect you and the other person in, in if they fail, if they're about to be harmed. You can use your bonds for other things. You can give each other uh, extra dice in certain times. And so the bonds are useful in that regard. But you form them... Uh, as you make your character, and then as you proceed through, you form bonds at the end of every adventure. And then leadership, which is just who's the first player. They, they uh, interpreting the signs of the gods, which is one of the things that happens at the end. And you have a final say over how the heroes face the trial. So if there's a, if there's a question, a dispute, then the, the leader is responsible for solving it. Here's what a character sheet looks like. It's pretty straightforward. You notice that there are a couple of marks next to each of the gods. Uh, and a particular name that's associated, or a particular word, authority, daring, insight. Right? Those are the divine favors that are associated with that god, and you can use them for those sorts of roles. You can spend those divine favors if you have it. That's really cool. Trials and contests. So this is the sort of the main action of the game, which is the contest uh, of the game. So first you face your opponent. You usually act as a single team, but sometimes you split up. Sometimes you might face an opponent alone. This procedure is the same in any case. So anyone can call for a contest, but the Strife player has the responsibility to be vigilant and identify when the heroes come into conflict. So the, the heroes could say, I want to challenge this. But it's the Strife player's job to say, okay, now this is a conflict, oh, now you guys have entered a conflict and all that stuff. The heroes confer with each other, then they declare their opposition by stating their approach and their goal. Now, obviously you're going to be role-playing in between this. It's not simply like a bunch of moments that you just roll dice for and then narrate. You're going to be role-playing in between this. But at these key moments, this is a very structured game. At these key moments then, okay, now we're entering a contest. How are you guys going to do it? What's the goal here? How are you going to try to overcome the, uh, the Strife player's action? Because the Strife player does something too. So here's the exact action that they say below on the right page, the example. At the funeral feast, Ma'ariki, Ma'ariki, Marika, Marika, there we go. I don't know what I'm saying. Marik, Marika shouts, let us sing laments for the fallen and bear our hearts one to the other. The heroes want to show the king that they care more about the deaths, the prince's death than the queen does. Sounds like a contest of arts and oration against Queen Naya. Okay. Or below that, the monstrous serpent of Nemos emerges from the shadows of the cave sanctum of the serpent cult, lured by a thrashing victim bound to their profane altar. The massive creature will surely consume the helpless soul unless the heroes can intervene and drive the foul beast back into its lair. A contest of blood and valor will determine their fate. So the strife player determines what the contest is in these particular cases. Sometimes the heroes can say what their approach is, which domain they want to use. Sometimes the, the uh, strife player says, this is the kind of contest you're facing. Based on your choices, based on what's happening, this is the kind of domain. And it says, the choice of domain depends upon the details of the situation and the actions of the characters involved. If the heroes initiate the action, focus on their approach and goals when choosing the domain. If the heroes resist an opponent, the domain should reflect the opponent's action. That's pretty cool. Then you have this dice pool system where essentially you use epithets and names for the creature um, and then any bonus dice they might have for circumstances there, if they have advantages or if the gods are angry with the person, then they can uh, add in challenging dice. And so then the, the opponent, the strife player rolls you take the highest value and then you add the strife level, which is usually five, but it could be four or six depending on if you know there's less strife here or more strife here on this island. And that's the DC the players are trying to hit for that particular test. So the strife player rolls it first. They use the name of the creature, the epithet of the creature, or this challenge, whatever it is. And then any bonus dice again, advantage dice or uh, wrath dice. 
And then the Strife player says, who among you will face the contest? <laughs> I think that's great. And then the players speak their names. They can mark Pathos to add a die from the uh, second domain, so you can add a domain dice in. If your epithet applies, you add a domain die um, for the contest that you have. So, you know, if it's Arts and Oration, you use that die. Uh, you're going to have different uh, levels of dice for the different ones. When you make your character, some of them will be d6s, most one will be a d8. So you're better at one thing than others, but you have the ability to use any of them. You can call on Divine Favor, get an extra d4, and spend some resources. You can spend a bond to get more dice. And if you have advantage, for whatever reason, you can get, basically you can use items or artifacts or previous successes to give you some extra dice. I like these little um, tables or these little images on the pages, it shows you all the dice you're gonna roll and then what the result will be. So you're gonna roll your name dice and your domain dice for sure. If your epithet die it, it applies, you're gonna add that in. If you have a bond, you can add that in. If you spend pathos, you can add in a second domain. If you have advantage for some reason, you can add that in. And then if you have divine favor, you can spend that to add it in. And then you roll all of those dice together and you sum the two highest and you add in divine favor. And that's your result. And you're trying to beat what the strife player rolled on their previous roll. That's it. That's how this works. And then the outcome is if you're equal to or greater, your hero prevails. And then whoever succeeded the best gets the best result and everyone else uh, just gets a sum result. And then if you fail, then your hero suffers. And usually there's something that goes along with failing. There's a hardship that comes about from failing, which the Strife player determines. And if all the heroes suffer, then the opponent wins. So if everybody fails, then the opponent wins. And then afterwards, you recite your deeds. You say what you did and it goes in a certain order. The person who failed has to describe first, the person who succeeded but not didn't succeed the best have to go and has to go next, and the person who succeeded best gets to describe their action of how they actually won. You get rewards, you should get a certain amount of glory, and glory is basically how you level up your character, it's experience points in a way. Uh, it's how your name, guy, name die gets bigger. And then you can use support. If you want to sit it out, you can help somebody, give them a little bonus. You get a little glory, you get a little bond, uh, and you just don't fight. And the other person gets the glory there. They, they do the main thing. If you fail, you get harm, and you cannot try again unless the circumstances have changed. Battles are a particular kind of trial. Um, once you've won all the contests, you can actually fight the final battle. And then there are three phases. There's, there's a clash, there's the threat, and then there's the finale. So the clash is where you just determine what's going on. Uh, if you win the clash, uh, the players choose how they want to approach the clash. And whoever wins it gets a d10 advantage die, which they may use during the battle. So if you succeed at the clash, you get an extra advantage for the actual threat. It's coming together to fight. Then there's the threat and the disasters that are happening. The strife player says what's going on. And the players can choose to either try to deal with the threats or to fight the thing itself. And so uh, the example is really cool. Um, Thessakyra invokes the power of the Pillar of Storms and summons a lightning bolt to sink the hero's ships. Her pirates corner Ionestes, the priest of Hera, and force him overboard to drown in the storming sea. Hagni's player rolls craft and reason to steer the ship away from the lightning and avoid that disaster. And Marika's player rolls blood and valor to defend Ionestes from the pirates. So they both decided to deal with the bad effects happen. Each hero who prevails may stop one disaster from happening. And they say there's usually two or three disasters for any particular threat phase. Or you can choose to ignore the disasters and let the consequences of those disasters happen or hope that your companions deal with them. And you can try to go for the threat itself to seize control. And if you seize control of the battle, then you have a lot more power during the finale. And the finale is where you actually roll uh, the final conflict. Oops. <laughs> there we go. The finale. This is where the final conflict happens. And there's three states that could happen. Either you lose the finale, so everybody loses the finale because it's another test. The opponent is the victor and they avoid punishment or trouble from the, from the battle. Strife is ascendant and the island slips into misery or woe. The heroes have fallen short. So you've failed. Right? This is, this is, uh, there's plenty of examples of this from the Odyssey. Right? I mean, when his, when Odysseus's men eat the, the, uh, the cattle of Helios, right? And they're all punished for it. Or, you know, like, the, like, there's lots of times in the Odyssey where bad stuff happens to the whole crew and nothing, nothing gets better and Odysseus just has to leave. Right? It's, they've fallen short. They might have gotten some glory from it. He's, he's become more famous from it, but it's just tragic. You could also win the finale, or uh, but lose the seize contest or not try to seize. And if you do that, then Strife is beaten back and you kind of win, but the enemy is not brought to account. Diminished for, source of trouble, but they're still around. The players to leave. The island is done, but they, their story hasn't been as successful as it could have been. 
And then the heroes, or if you finally win the finale and seize the and win the seas, then strife is overcome. The opponent is defeated, and the heroes win the day. And the opponent suffers the fate the heroes chose for them. That's one of the things you can do when you win the seas contest. You choose what the fate of the enemy will be if you win the finale. So really cool. I love how this works. There's the clash, then there's the threat, and you can choose to seize or defend. Defend against the bad stuff that's happening, or try to seize the the, the, the victory. And if there's enough of you, you can you can do all of it, right? If you have a party of four people and there are three disasters, then you could have each player try one to defend against one of the disasters, and then you have one player try to seize the victory. So, you know, it recommends the game be between three to six players. What that means is one Strife player and two to five uh, hero players. And then there are lots of kinds of battles. So obviously, Blood and Valor is the easiest one, like actual combat, but there are lots of different kinds of battles you could have. An arts and oration contest, right, which is a dance competition, a music performance, poetry recitation, whatever it might be. So there are lots of different ways of having this form applied to different kinds of contests. And I think that's really cool. There'd be a lot of flexibility with this system um, in telling stories. Respite, this is the inter-game period, inter-challenge inter period. You have the Exodus, which is where you leave the island, you figure out the destiny of the island, the Strife player tells you what happens there, and you mark it all down in your book. Then there's a Great Deed, which each player chooses something that they've done. Um, and either they can choose a Great Deed, or they can take a trophy, if, if it makes sense from their adventure. And so that adventure, that trophy, can be used as an advantage for them in one contest later. So you can call upon your previous successes, something that you did to be to be uh, you know to be a, a great thing later. Then you have virtues. There's acumen, courage, grace, and passion. And every other player at the table talks about a moment where they think you exemplified that. Your player exemplified that. So and then everybody gives you these these things. So for example, you see, let's do Marika first. This is an easy one. You battle that harpy in the air all by yourself. Courage for sure. Yeah, that was cool, another player says, but I liked how she proved that the priest was plotting against the king, acumen from me. Oh, she saved my ass by jumping in the water while our boats were moving at full speed. It's courage from me. Marika player, Marika's player records two courage and one acumen, and the players begin recounting the virtues of the next hero. So it's more collaborative there, too, that your character gets these virtue points, um, which come into play at the very end when you're talking about your character's fate, basically. And uh, the other players decide that what they saw in your character to be and what they thought exemplified it in that session. It's really cool. And then finally, reflection. If you realize your epithet doesn't apply anymore, you can change it. Then there's the voyage, which is the fellowship phase. You're all supposed to talk to each other in, in character, I suppose. The hero player takes their own turn strengthening bonds, asking a question of a player who has not yet been asked. What's one of your best memories from home? Uh, who, what drives you? What do you think of the gods? And those are just questions as examples. It says, feel free to make up your own. And then you take a bond with these players to which you can use that. And sacrifice, which is how to get divine favor from the gods of your choice. Um, and, uh, you know, sacrifice is not always well received. Sometimes it can be bad. Sometimes wrath can happen. Um, and that's not good because, again, the wrath die is used for your enemies when they're, uh, so the gods can take particular dislikes to you. And then there's the vault of heaven, and this is how you end the game end the campaign. Basically, as you move through the game, if you greatly pleased a deity on that island, you mark a star in the constellation. And if you greatly please them, you might have uh, multiple stars. And for every three stars that are marked for a particular god, you earn a boon. And when it's completely filled, you get a bond with that deity. So you can call on that bond later. And if you've ever displeased that god in particular, you might get wrath of that god. And the goal of the game here is how you end it, is if you get three constellations full for a short game, you get home. For a long game, five constellations, you get home. But obviously, because you can take wounds during these challenges, you can take harm in these challenges, you could lose all your pathos, which is sort of your hit points, which you can draw on, but other sometimes creatures drain it from you. If that all goes to zero and you don't have any more pathos, then you can leave your story before you make it home. So that's the timer, that's the threat. Here's the legend of your character. Glory, which is experience point, it advances your name die at certain points. After you get a certain amount of glory, you level up, basically. Your name die gets bigger. Agony, which is what happens when you um, start to go down. When you enter agony, mark fate. Each mark is permanent and brings your hero closer to their end. So if you've lost all your pathos, you start marking fate instead of agony. And fate 
kills you off. It doesn't go away. Agony goes away after it. Pathos comes back after every fight. Agony goes away. But fate does not go away. So if it ever goes down to zero, if your fate ever tracks up, I should say, your character leaves. Um, and that's it. And they can either die or they can, if the story makes sense and something like that. So as their fate increases, however, and they make progress towards home, there are some benchmarks. Um, you advance domain dice, you can add your epithet, epithet dice, you can give you benefits to bolstering. So there's a little bit of character development in terms of your mechanical ability, but there's not a lot in this game. That's not what this is for. How the game ends, you get your legend. Once you finish, you get a legendary title, depending on which of your uh, virtues were highest. You can pick a title. You have to say what your greatest deed was, and you look at the vault of heaven. Did you appease the gods, or did you not? When your fate finally runs out, when it finally have you have you filled out three to five constellations, three to five constellations. If so, you get to go home. If not, what happened to you? And you get a, a glorious name, depending on how high your name die is. If you're a D6, it's a notable character. If it's a D12, it's an epic hero. Then you get to write your, your legend, and then you make a new hero. And then there's a few additional things here, how bonds work, how the god bonds work, how you might get advantages, how to mark pathos, how to remove pathos, divine favor, and how to spend it. And then guidance for the strife player, how to prepare the game, how to play the game, the tone that you're looking for, first sessions, beyond sessions, one shots, all of that. It has this three-step thing. Reveal, ask, and judge. That's what the strife player should do. Reveal the situation, ask questions and build on their answers, and judge the contest and resolve the outcomes. Very straightforward, with, with good examples here as well. And then examples for how to reveal, how to ask, and how to judge. Awesome. Straightforward two-page spreads on the three main core mechanics of the strife player's role. Final say, things to avoid, things to try out. How to raise or lower the strife level and when to do that. And then Praxis, which is, you know, the validity of the game, death and destruction, scale and scope, the expression, a uh, good example of play, an extended example of play. And then the islands, the particular ex uh, islands that you can use, where there are pre-made sort of adventures and things going on. There's the lands of strife, and this is how the structure of each adventure is. Preparation, signs of the gods, arrival, presenting the trials, and then an island guide, the starter islands you have. So Cryos, uh, Nemos, Soros, and Ion, Timosos, uh, Vrakoi, and uh, Fenios, I think, are the main starter islands. And then you have further islands. There's the Koros, the Gulf of Karis, Spira, uh, Cordia, Inu, and Kriconia, Kriconia. And then you have a description of each of them. What's going on here, the signs of the gods, which gods are at play here, uh, and which gods then you can therefore favor or gain favor with or maybe gain, you know, make angry. <laughs> uh, the arrival and what happens there. These are pretty, like pretty direct. I mean, this is, again, very structured. This is not a huge open sandbox. You could play it that way. I think you could probably do that with the players. Present a bunch of islands that they could travel to next. Give them choice. But the game is structured, you know, very solidly. So there's there's certain trials you're going to face, certain battles you're undergo, the characters that are there, the places that you're going to go, the special rewards you could get if you choose it, and then the mysteries here. You get Nemos, Soros and Ion, and again, the art here is excellent. It really fits with what's going on here. Very reminiscent of the old Greek um, you know, pot art and things like that. But obviously in its own style. It's not just like, you know, recreations of that. Really cool images here. Really cool pieces of art. Kikonia, it's a beautiful piece. I love that. The rules for creating an island uh, and creating characters. Uh, some, some very few sample tables. A D12 table for environs, people, events, and unearthly things. A compendium, brief uh, names, style, epithets, hero creation. Contest summaries and how that works, a battle summary and how that works, a lexicon, very useful. And then a cultural primer with agon and identity, Greek mythology, swords and sandals if you're an expert, and what you should do and how good ways to express your knowledge, bad ways to express your knowledge if you don't know as much, stereotypes. Um, yeah, it's pretty reasonable to me. Beyond Greece, if you wanted to do this in other cultures, Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Greco-Indian kingdoms, um, if you wanted to be more like that as opposed to more Greek, you can, there's an example given to you here, but you can do your own. And then an index at the back of the book with the character sheet. Here's what the character sheet looks like. Really cool. Um, I think that's really, really awesome. It looks different than a lot of character sheets out there. 
Here's your Vault of Heaven sheet with a brief description of contests, harms, bonds, supports. This would be a great thing to give to your players. And a little piece of the air at the end. So that is Agon. Really, really cool. And totally unique. I mean, there's nothing really like that, at least, at least that I know. There's nothing really like this out there. Now, you could also get the additional islands. There's a 42-page PDF with a bunch of additional islands. Agrios. Let's see, what else do we have here? Um, Aplestia. Uh, Gorgona. Kelides. Uh, Chrysi. Kirsi. Ophanos. Persephone's Garden. That's really cool. Skia, and that's it. So you get a bunch of extra um, islands if you want to get this book. I think it comes with uh, any purchase of it. And then you get the player kit, which is just the stuff that was in the back of the book with a few extra things, so extra epithets and names, style, advice for making your characters. You could give this to your player with a reference sheet, how the game works, a couple of the extra pages, island destinies and island, uh, you know, for each of the islands you've gone to, notes. This really cool image here to keep it very clear on how this game works and then another one of these character sheets at the end. So a really cool little character uh, pack that comes with it. So I highly recommend Agon, especially right now it's on sale. I'd recommend getting the physical copy. I don't have it yet. I ordered it. I don't know when it's coming. Um, I mean, it's in the mail, I assume. But it's, uh, I don't know the quality of it. So it could be really good. It could be not so good. But Blades in the Dark is a great quality book. And this is by Evil Hat Productions. It's the same company. So I assume it's going to be really good quality. Um, but I don't know. So I won't comment on that so much. But the PDF, the content of this, is, is excellent. As you guys can see, I, I mean, I really love, I love Greek and Roman history. Um, I love Greek mythology. The Iliad is one of my favorite works of all time. I think it's beautiful and absolutely expressive of a certain aspects of humanity. Just really good. So I, I, this is right up my alley. This is made for me in a lot of ways. But I think if you're interested in a more narrative-heavy storytelling guide or storytelling aid, and the stories you want to tell are mythic, epic, Greek stories. This is the place to go. This is the best that I've seen for this particular... It's very specific, but it's, it's really good. All right, guys. I hope this has been interesting. I'll see you in another video.